be our life. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to iFocus Online, episode 351. Today for the oculoplasty series number 26, we have Dr. Mohammad Javed Ali back with us again, speaking on the deformities and diseases of the lacrimal canaliculi, an overview and management. For those of you who wasn't there with us last time, I'll just give a short introduction for Sir again. He's presently the head of Govindram Sekhsariya Institute of Dacrology and an alumni of the, of the prestigious LDPI. He's a Hong Kong professor from University of Singapore, a DAAD professor from Friedrich Alexander University, Germany, and professor of Wojciechowski Institute of Medicine, Warsaw, Poland, and the Kransov Research Institute, Moscow. His clinical and research area of work include dacryology. He has received numerous awards, including the AAO, ASOPRS, Lester T. Jones Award, the Merrill Ree Award, and the Shanti Swarup Bhatnagar Prize. He's the editor-in-chief for seminars in ophthalmology, the associate editor of Survey of Ophthalmology, Ocular Surface and Ocular Research. He has numerous publications, awards, and invited lectures to his name, and is on the editorial boards of numerous ophthalmic journals. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Titi. Yes. Let me just share my... Is that visible now? Yes, sir. Okay. Okay, so I think last time we had a on a one hour discussion on diseases of the punctum where I gave a little overview of the punctum disorders and today we'll talk about an overview of the canalicular disorders. As always, there are a lot of disorders and the intention of this talk is not to cover them in detail because it's simply not possible to do that in an hour. But what I'll do is that I'll just take you briefly just to give you an overview of what are things and, you know, very briefly into the management if there is any. Okay. So these are my financial disclosures. So the overview will be, I will take you through a normal anatomy of the canaliculus because I feel that that's something which is very important and uh, a lot of things that we know or we tend believe to know about canaliculi, a lot of things uh, which are mentioned in the books or textbook or articles, it's a little different from, from a lot of things that we are taught. And then we'll discuss about a few of the canalicular disorders. Okay, so anatomy, never look at anatomy in two dimensions. Anatomy becomes very boring if you study in the way typically that we are taught in medical schools about anatomy. This is how the canaliculi look like. Now, if you look at this, it's obvious that you are talking about upper and lower canaliculi here. And then this is a part of the lacrimal sac where I'm trying to show you the common canalicular opening. Now, when you look at this, look at this upper one. Do you find it as a straight line? It is actually not a straight line. There are, it is like this. See this? It's more like an accordion kind of a thing. This is after we have fixed this tissue. If it was in the original form, this would be a little more accordion-like, little more. It's never like a straight line that you think canaliculi are. And the typical concept that is two millimeter vertical and eight millimeter horizontal, no, that's not true always. Most of the time, it's actually not true. If you look at this lower one, yeah, there's nothing like vertical canaliculus here. You see that what is presumed to be vertical actually continues immediately as a horizontal uh, arm of that canalicula and that horizontal arm again is not straight. If I show you a scanning electron of this same picture, it will be a little more clear. Now look at this, how this particular canaliculi is, it's different areas have different luminal diameters and then obviously it is not a straight line. And then the lower one, as I was telling you, there is no typical vertical and then the horizontal canaliculi. It's just a simple curve like this and it continues. Interestingly, these, the canaliculi there, you see the upper canaliculi, lower canaliculi forming into a common canaliculus. And then you see that even up to the common canaliculus, there is such an intricate arrangement of muscles all around it. And this is very important for its function. 
Now, if you look at this picture, this is a cut section of the canalic line. And you see this beautiful epithelium here. You can see this is, this is how the epithelium actually looks like. Like when we study histopathology, it's two-dimensional. But three-dimensional, this is how each of these long, tall cells appear like. Now, this is the wall of the canaliculi. And look at this wall of the canaliculi is so intricately attached to these bundles of the Horner's muscles all around 360 degrees. If I just take you a little high magnification of this, you find that this wall is actually attached to this muscle. That means whenever the muscle contracts, it is going to influence the canalicular walls. Now, this is a pattern recognition, three-dimensional reconstruction of how a canaliculi is. One, you will find that the dilatation and it's not uniform, right? And you don't see, this is a horizontal canaliculus within the muscle. So I have transected the muscles, cut that one just to expose the canaliculi within the Horner's muscle. And you see, what do you see? You see, it's never a straight cord, right? It is like an accordion. So this is very important to understand that whenever you place a probe or anything, the probe has to lie on the lid margin and has to be parallel to the lid margin. If you really want to negate these angles, right? So, so it's this is an important concept there. Now, this is the opening of the common canaliculus. What you what we are seeing is end-on common canaliculus from the lacrimal sac side. So, what do you see? You see a small septum here, and this is the upper canaliculus, and this is the lower canaliculus. And this from the depth to here is the common canaliculus. So that concept that we think about that one is coming from the upper, one is from the lower, and both of them become then become one uniform and then go out. It's actually not like that. It is three-dimensional, it's, it's a little different, right? So now you see here, upper, lower canaliculus, then they come into this area. And this is uh, the sinus of mare, which is a depression. And this depression, from this depression to the lacrimal sac margin of this opening, this is what we actually call as common canaliculus. But it is not that kind of, again, a line like that. Occasionally, you will not even have the sinus of mare. Where he, this is one of those examples where you see the com opening of the canaliculi distinctly directly coming into the lacrimal sac. So all this that I have shown, we have, we have published a lot of these things. You can always go back and read these things to have a little detailed uh, understanding of the overview I just gave you about the anatomy. Okay, let's start with some disorders. Canalicular agenesis. Now, canalicular agenesis, if there is a canalicular agenesis, so there's not going to be any punctum, right? It's common logical thing. So every canalicular agenesis will have a punctal agenesis. But is the vice versa true? That is what is important. So how do you identify that? Obviously, there's going to be a punctal agenesis. So all the findings of punctal agenesis would be there in, in these patients. Like no punctum papilla, no punctal opening, right? The hair in the pars lacrimalis portion, like you see here, here. And then the opening of the lid, uh, the conjunctiva over the canaliculi, this area, look at how the lid margin actually is. It's a little pulpy and round. But look at here, what happens in canalicular agenesis. There's a depression like that in the, because the conjunctiva in that area, little there's an atrophy because there's no, there's no, you know, tubular structure underneath it. So there's going to be a little uh, depression kind of a, a thing there. Now, so coming back to that question, so we did a lot of these patients where we suspected punctal agenesis. We just started getting transecting them and trying to assess whether there is a canaliculi uh, underneath. And we didn't find in any of the punctal agenesis that we've studied, we never found any canaliculi. So that concept that if there is a punctal agenesis, uh, we need to cut down the canaliculi and try to find the canaliculi. Well, if it's a real punctal agenesis, it's very unlikely that you're going to find canalicula. At least I never found any canalicula, uh, at least in the patients that I studied. So those concepts that were placed are still there in the literature of going retrograde intubation and all those things are not going to work, right? Well, you can pass anything from anywhere and come out anywhere. But that doesn't mean 
that it's going to remain like that because for anything to happen, uh, it needs to be a luminal epithelium line, luminal cavity that has to be there. So that's not going to work. So retrograde intubation, at least for punctal and canal echolorigenesis, should not be done. And then you can obviously the routine things of managing it either through Jones and nowadays through lacrimal gland targeted therapies can be done in those cases with punctal and canal echolorigenesis. But normally what I have seen is very unlikely that these people need it because uh, of the evolving concepts that we now have, that there is a crosstalk that happens between the lacrimal gland and the lacrimal drainage system. So over a period of time, especially in congenital disorders, you don't find people having, you know, punctal and canal echolorigenesis upper and lower, but they won't be dripping like they would uh, be dripping had they been an acquired kind of a thing. Because there is some kind of a feedback that happens and uh, we are trying to study that feedback and look at those uh, autonomic and neuroregulatory feedbacks. But there is something that is uh, that prevents these people from uh, becoming too symptomatic. There's another entity which we call it as canalicular wall dysgenesis. Now we should avoid using, when you go back into a little older literature, even of 10 years ago, you find a lot of these terms, punctal atresia or canalicular atresia. It's not a good term to use. Uh, either there is an agenesis or there is a dysgenesis. Two simple, very simple things, agenesis or dysgenesis. Right. So let us discuss canalicular wall dysgenesis. Dysgenesis means what? Canaliculi have formed, but there is some congenital issues with that canalicular wall. Now, canalicular dysgenesis, there are eight different types of canalicular dysgenesis. I won't go into those details, but broadly, it can either be a hypoplasia of the canalicular walls or it can be aplasia of the canalicular walls. So how would you know that one? Now look at this picture on you to your right. This is a probe going into a normal canalicular. You normally don't see the probe, right? You don't see the shine or anything of the probe. Look at this. What is happening here? Here you see that it's not open. There is obviously a canalicular wall, but it is thinned out. It's hypoplastic wall of the canalicular. Look at this another example. When you are trying to dilate, look at this example where you can actually see the entire length of the probe passing through the canalicular. So the significance of this is that you should not be aggressive either for dilatation or and you should be very careful while passing a probe. If you find canalicular dysgenesis, you should be careful because it's very, very easy to get rid of this membrane. You know, you can just create an incision into the membrane just by passing the probe and that can just, uh, you know, expand and then that can have uh, adverse effect on whatever functional, uh, uh, you know, the canalicular function which are there which will be a little compromise in these patients. And if you're not careful, then you will exacerbate that functional uh, compromise. This is just an example to show how. So whenever you're passing a probe, you need to be a little aware of this condition as well. A lot of these people, canalicular wall dysgenesis, usually uh, are, are not uh, very symptomatic. Most of the time, it's an accidental finding, unless it's a canalicular aplasia. Canalicular aplasia means where part of the canaliculi will be opened up like here, but there will be either very fine membrane or very beautiful, uh, you know, normal canaliculi all around it and there'll be a focal opening. This is another example of uh, a canalicular opening here. This you should differentiate it from post-traumatic canalicular fistula, which obviously will have history of trauma and there will be a scarring. It will never be a smooth canalicular wall like you normally see. These are examples of... Uh, large aplasias of the canalicular wall where you can see that such a big segment is there, right? And there won't be any kind of a scarring in this vicinity and you can see conjunctiva very beautiful, very smooth all around it. Right? This is another very crude example, very, very massive example of a canalicular uh, aplasia which people have tried to suture it back and then it just opened up again. So this is one of those papers that talks about different types of this canonical dysgenesis and how you diagnose and how you manage some of them. Coming to another entity, canaliculops. Now canaliculops is non-inflammatory and non-infectious. This is these two terms are important in the context of canaliculops. 
non-inflammatory and non-infectious distension of the canalicular wall. Most of the time, it's a focal distension. And that presents as a swelling in the upper lid in the canalicular region like you see in this particular patient. OCT is not of much use, but if you happen to do ultrasound UBM, it would show you a nice canalicular wall around all sides, and then it will show you a nice cyst-like structure within the canaliculus. So this is something that can easily be marsupialized and part of it can be removed. Histopathologically is not very different, just that you have uh, a little bit of, you know, a little more spread out kind of sub epithelial tissues. The canalicular epithelium is as like any other canalicular, and this is the differential point for this one, because whenever you uh, you get the cyst out and when you do a histopathology, you will always find that it is lined by a canalicular epithelium, typical canalicular squamous epithelium with a basement palisading pattern, regimental arrangement of that epithelium that is there, very typical of canalicular epithelium. Another interesting point of that is that it's the superficial part of it stains with CK7 staining, like you see. It's a very, very typical and diagnostic feature of a canalicular epithelium and canalicular canaliculops. Sometimes it's very rare that it can be bilateral. This is something which is a little unusual, bilateral upper and lower one. And again, you see that we try to do a UBM there. Then we try to do a dacroendoscopy into those things. It just looks like any other cystic cavity. But the thing is that it looks like uh, how you would see a canaliculi from, um, you know, uh, how you would see canalicula through a dacroendoscope, a normal canalicula, just that it is too dilated. And then again, CK7 is positive like you see here, and this can be marsupialized and excised. There's few papers on canaliculops that we have published and with different manifestations, you can have a look at these papers at your leisure. Now, like last time, I will speak on ICID because ICID is specifically a canalicular disease which will have manifestations at the punctum. So ICID, as I might have mentioned you earlier, goes to distinct five clinical stage. The first stage is of a peripunctal edema, but it is actually not a punctal edema. It's the edema of the vertical canalicular mucosa. You know, So this is the punctal opening that you see. And this mucosa that you see is very swollen and large and pale. Uh, this is the mucosa of the vertical canaliculus. So this disease, I said, as you know, it starts in third and fourth uh, decade of life. Uh, we do not know why it happens, uh, but it has something to do with the the gross inflammation of the canaliculi, again, non-infectious inflammation of the canaliculus. Um, we are now suspecting uh, certain types of T lymphocytes to be involved in the pathogenesis of ICID. And we are working to identify what specific T subsets, T cell subsets are there, uh, which drive this pathogenesis. The second stage, if you don't treat it, will be a typical stage of circumferential uh, vascularization from all centripetal vascularization all around. The vessels will grow towards the punctum. Again, this whole thing is a vertical canalicular mucosa, which is now getting vascularized after uh, having edema. This is stage two. Stage three is uh, vascularized, the mucosa is now vascularized and it pouts out of the punctal opening, the vertical canalicular mucosa. Right? And this inflammation happens all along the length of the horizontal canalicular also. But since you cannot always put in a dacryo endoscope and see, this is a manifestation uh, that, you know, we are trying to stage it based on these manifestations so that you know what is happening inside. Then if you don't treat that also, then there's a membrane, vascularized membranes that form as you see here. Stage four and stage five is when it's completely scarred and shut down. So initial, I said we were not able to manage with whatever we do, but subsequently when we found out that certain different T cell subsets are involved, we started placing them on topical cyclosporin and that has, I wouldn't say greatly changed, but I would say at least half of the patients, now we are able to downstage them and help them with other modalities. So this, this is, these are papers that talk about those protocols of management of different stages of ICID and how do you go about those 
uh, managing those things. Now the next is infective canaliculitis. This is one of the common disorders that a lot of us tend to come across. This is an infectious, unlike all the other ones that I showed till so far. This is an infective etiology. Now this is, as you are aware, well, it's very typical canalicular swelling with discharge, chronic conjunctivitis. Uh, however, this might appear very, you know, glaring to an oculoplastic surgeon. That's usually not the case with general ophthalmologists. And this is something that is uh, unfortunately quite misdiagnosed as chronic conjunctivitis. So you need to be a little careful about uh, this entity. Now, canaliculitis most of the time can simply be managed by milking. You know, like you see in this particular patient, you can just milk out the contents and discharge like you see here, concretions. But to believe that canaliculitis can only be bacterial is also not right. This is a typical one example of a multiviral canaliculitis. Well, there are a lot of giveaways in this particular case. I can see the nasal tip. This was a combination of herpes simplex and cytomegalovirus canaliculitis. And then and this is and this with acyclovir and topical antivirals, we were able to retrieve and salvage this canaliculi. So this is something which is important to understand. This multiviral canaliculitis is not going to behave exactly the same as a, a bacterial one, which is a little more florid and more upfront. Viral is going to be a little less upfront. Well, typically, if you catch up a little early, little discharge and somewhere at four to five millimeters, very typical stenosis, mid canalicular stenosis in the with the suspicion of something uh, like an infection should alert you towards a viral etiology. Well, sometimes some unique things also happen. Canaliculitis can, can be really, you know, can really be intriguing. Like in this particular patient, this particular patient um, was having canaliculitis being treated that doesn't work. But this gentleman was having an E. coli urinary tract infection. So some strange reasons, every time he had an E. coli UTI, he had an E. coli canaliculitis. And this is one of the papers that we published on that and how we were able to diagnose it. Now, does it mean that there is an endogenous? We don't know. We really, you know, but this is a possibility just like so, an endogenous endophthalmitis can happen, something like that. And uh, if uh, we went ahead and aggressively went behind his urinary tract infections, prolonged medications, and that helped in managing uh, the canaliculitis. So other than milking, uh, we normally don't go and cut canaliculitis by punctoplasties or canalicular incisions. We don't do that anymore for obvious reasons of uh, that we were discussing last time when we were talking about punctum. It's not a good idea to do a punctoplasty or cut anything around the punctum because it comes with a functional compromise baggage. So any canaliculitis, we tend to dilate nicely. You know, nicely means you should dilate it very well so that it opens up nicely. And then once that happens, we first milk it out like this. And then we use the smallest calcium scope, mayor off. And that you need to be gentle. Now you don't need to really worry. Uh, uh, you know, obviously it should be gentle, but you don't need to really worry because the canaliculi are usually very dilated because of the discharge. And most of the time, because of the concretions. So you gently get in and gently scoop out the canalicular contents all. And remember that most of the contents are in the ampullary region. That's one area that people miss, right? So for example, if I am trying to go for the canalicula here, you tend to go towards a, towards a common canaliculus, right? Just wait a little bit and go down towards ampulla and go a little laterally and scoop it out because that's where we tend to miss a lot of this because ampulla is the most dilated part of the canaliculi. It's so at the junction of the vertical and horizontal canaliculi. And that is where most of these concretions are housed. So just remember that. So here again, like I am showing you, just go and retrieve it out and you can do that very well. Remove everything. Occasionally for recalcitrant cases, we also put in a dacro endoscope here as I am showing you. 
put in a daiquiri endoscope, see if there's something, then again go back and take it out. Very rarely that you would need to do this procedure of canalicular curettage and cutting down the canaliculi and unless there is some, you know, that happens only in recalcitrant cases we do that. Complications occasionally if you don't manage that very well, you see like that this particular case, it has led to a canalicular fistula. So chronic long-standing canaliculitis, the canalicular concretions can just pop out on their own, just like how an abscess drains and can cause canalicular fistulae. So you need to be a little careful. Now, this is how the canalicular concretions look like. If you see on a little bit of um, scanning electron microscopy. Now, when you look at uh, this picture of this canalicular concretions, what do we see? We see a hell lot of filamentous organisms. So, if you look at the literature, the literature, especially from India and uh, from, from the eastern part of the world, uh, has always said that you no, know, we don't get actinomyces. We have actinomyces is a specific thing that is isolated in the West. And we have staph as the commonest thing. Now, we found that that is not true, you know, uh, because we don't have those kind of culture media and we don't go behind culturing specifically the actinomyces. And that's why we get what is a mixed infection. So we get whatever other organisms are there. We get we tend to get them. But that doesn't mean that actinomyces is not there. So when we did metagenomics of these concretions, we found that actinomyces is presented everywhere. Right, almost every concretions. All those, all those uh, patients where the microbiological culture has shown Staphylococcus and all kind of organisms, and never showed actinomyces, all had actinomyces. Okay, so just remember that actinomyces can be a minor player on the side, and we found that Fusobacterium and Prevotella are quite common organisms. And when we looked at what these organisms were doing in the canalic life in terms of functions, we found that they were involved in functions like adhesions, carbon dioxide fixation, cell divisions, which just means what? Means that these bacteria which are there have are trying to express proteins that are going to make them adherent to the canalicular walls, right? And they are willing to do carbon dioxide fixation. That means what? In case if there is an anaerobic environment or unfavorable environment, these bacteria will overcome that one. They will still be able to manage in that. Because of these things, now we partly understand why it's a little difficult to treat canaliculite infections, unlike a lacrimal sac infections, where the organisms in the lacrimal sac don't get involved into carbon dioxide fixations or um, you know, uh, going into dormant cell dormancies or adhesions. So that doesn't happen, but it happens with the canaliculite infection. So these organisms are known to do that. And that's why it's going to be a little uphill task in managing canalic matters. There's a various papers that uh, talk about management of canalic colitis and different kind of canalic colitis. Okay. Canalic trauma. Well, this is something that every one of us see day in and day out. Most of those injuries at the medial canthal area involve the canalic colitis. Okay. So, what sometimes appear very innocuous once you go and see in detail, this is a massive canalicular laceration, which on a cursory examination was not appearing to be canalicular because the punctum was good and it had just appeared that there's an anterior small cut and the canalicular, everything is in place. But if you see actually, there is a large lacerations. Well, managing this is something that I think every one of us do, does. Typical calamari sign that you see here. You can easily identify the cut end of it. Typical calamari sign. Right? Calamari sign means that it looks like a white ring because canaliculum mucosa is a little whitish as compared to the surrounding tissue. So a little easy to identify that. And then it's as simple as dilate the punctum and then just pass the manuka and then pass it into the other thing and just approximate the cut end. And that's something pretty easy to do. This is just an example of this one patient where you can see the distance there's a lot of notching there and then subsequently it heals out very beautifully. And there's something that can easily be managed. 
Now the question that comes in is, how long should we retain stents in canalicular trauma? I don't think anything more than four weeks actually helps if you keep it for more than, because most of the canalicular healing happens by four weeks. This is just an example where we tried to do that. And I wanted to study how the canalicular wall heals. So we created canalicular lacerations like you see. This is rabbit eyes. Uh, and then we placed master cars and then subsequently removed it at different time points and studied the healing process of the canalicular. The canalicular epithelium where the incision happens, it heals by a hyperplastic epithelium. There's an epithelial continuation, but it becomes a little hyperplastic with a little sub-epithelial fibrosis. But nonetheless, this is uh, uh, something that heals very quickly. So I personally don't place stents beyond four weeks because stents beyond four weeks tend to invite a lot of inflammation because of the biofilms and I don't want that to happen in a wound area. Okay, so if you don't treat it well, uh, this is what can happen. Post-traumatic canalicular fistulas like you see here. And occasionally, if it is not open, you see that it's not well closed up. It just opened it up. And then you can see that the entire canaliculus lumen is seen. And then this is a stent there. Occasionally, what should have gone here is just protruding out through the wound inferiorly, the stent misdirected one. Because it just came out from the other end and it's just lying outside. So these are all complications that happen if you don't repair it very well. Canalicular foreign bodies. Now, common canalicular foreign body is usually a lash. That's that's very common. Sometimes you also find punctal plugs, which people use for uh, punctal stenosis or in patients, vice versa for dry eyes to block the punctum. Those are usual common uh, foreign bodies. It's very rare that you would find uh, monocast stents housed inside, dislodged for a long time, like you see in this particular case. Uh, but nonetheless, whenever you have a canalicular foreign body, you should go ahead and uh, get that out. Another common problem that we see, canalicular stenosis and obstructions. Uh, this instrument is little helpful in identifying it. Probe also does help. If you have decent experience with probe, obstruction definitely you can make it out. But even stenosis over a period of time with good probe, you can manage it out. Now this is how the canaliculi looks from inside. This is a dacryo endoscopic picture. You see it's a nice dilated canaliculi. Nice dilated canaliculi that you see. It's a little whitish in color compared to the one that you see on extreme right picture. That is how the lacrimal sac looks like, pinkish compared to the whitish mucosa of the canalic line. Now, this is an example of the same patient, how the canalic line is there. And as I'm going forward, you see it is getting stenosed and then it has become really stenosed at this point. It is not obstructed, but it is stenosed, grossly stenosed, I would say. And look at this. Another example of it. Initial part is dilated, but as I'm going into the distal canal, it's like getting stenosed and it's like almost near total obstruction. Compare this to a fibrous obstruction. See, this is, I'm still in the canal, it's like distally I'm seeing that there is something which is narrowed down. So this is the canalical wall, but I'm seeing that this canalical wall is having fibrosis all around. See this, this is all fibrosis. And as you're going there forward, there's no lumen there. There is a little nice fibrous tissue with little specks of blood. If you go close, you see that everything is obstructed by a fibrous tissue. Now managing these canalicular obstructions, these are very specifically designed trephines that you see. These are called as a Sistler trephines, very typically designed. And there is a way of using these trephines in a very nice and safe way. To, to get rid of that obstruction. And this is how one of the cases where the Sisler trephine has come through the common canaliculus. And you see how beautifully it has trephined a nice chunk of the luminal fibrosis of the canaliculi that you see. This is the stillet and this is the edge of the trephine. 
still it keeps guiding you towards an obstruction. It will tell you ahead of time, before your trephine reaches that point, the stillet is designed in a way that any obstruction, the stillet will keep coming back to tell us that an incoming obstruction is coming the way. So that when your trephine comes, you're ready with the trephine to trephine that, that obstructed segment. Well, these are uh, little newer modalities that we are still experimenting, I would say, with the with this one where you see you're using coronary catheters. The regular balloon decroplasty is something that you can't use because it's two millimeter and you can't expand a canaliculus with a two millimeter. It will rupture, especially a, a, a fibrous segment. It will easily rupture. So you can't use those traditional balloon decroplasty. So what I'm using here is uh, one millimeter. One millimeter means on full dilatation, it can become maximum of one millimeter. So it's on a average when you go, it is less than 0.3 in an undilated stage. So you go and you can dilate the whole segment of the canaliculi, uh, but we are still in an early stage for that. This is another example, which where there was a punctum and a canaliculus So you look at the punctum, it has become like a pinpoint punctum. Uh, this is secondary to a, a anti-cancer drug called Pemetrex, which is commonly used in uh, squamous cell carcinomas of the lung and adenocarcinomas of the lung. So anyway, whenever this carcinoma, this this drug is used, typically after three to four cycle, it causes uh, punctal stenosis and canalicular stenosis. And canalicular are also stenosed, as you see in dacryl endoscopy. So these are the cases where we had gone with those one millimeter coronary angioplasty catheters and dilated. Look at this and look at how beautifully it has dilated uniformly. And look at this internal part of the canaliculi and look at how this is very beautifully dilated. And then we place a monoka there. These are some of those papers that discuss about canaliculus stenosis and obstruction and how to go about managing them. Lastly, canalicular tumors. Well, this is an example of a lesion that has arising from a very vascularized lesion that you see, which is arising from the canalicular walls. Fortunately, it turned out to be a granuloma. Another example of a granuloma that you see on the surface when you see it covers the whole punctum. But if you just remove, just keep it a little separate with a probe, you see that this is the punctum opening, which is very normal and nice. And you see that it's actually arising from the canalic line. This is how it appears after you have gone ahead and excised it, uh, the canalicular granuloma. Occasionally, you also find a uh, See, there's a nice pigmented lesion within the punctum. This is the punctum, normal, and you see that there is a pigmented lesion. Another example of such a lesion where you see a pigmented squamous papilloma. So this is a pigmented squamous papilloma arising from the canalicular epithelium and protruding now out of the punctal region. This is the dacryoendoscopy image of the horizontal canaliculus where you see that this is a nice pigmented lesion here. This later turned out to be a pigmented squamous papilloma. See, that's everything. You can see it's right going right up to the canaliculus. This is just a schematic diagram to show how that lesion is in the canaliculus. Sometimes you can also see upfront squamous papillomas with nice fonts that you see. This is in the horizontal canaliculus. You see two lesions which are there. It is just to give you the schematic of how it appears. Two lesions, and you can see these are vascular fonts on this one, small depressions there, and then there's a vascular font, just like you see papillomas on the conjunctival surface. But this is in the canal within the canaliculi. And you can use interferons, uh, or you can just, these are some of the indications where you can actually incise and go after them, specifically if you're suspecting malignancies in on endoscopy. This is an example of a peripunctal squamous uh, sebaceous gland carcinoma, which is infiltrating the canaliculus like you see here. So whenever you suspect any lesions to have infiltrated canaliculus, the patient should also have a consent for an extended dacrocystectomy, uh, not only dacrocystectomy, because then you would remove the lid lesion and then you would go behind it right up to the canaliculi, distal canaliculi, remove this lesion, take the canalicular specimens separately for frozen section, 
intraoperative get clearance and keep going till you get clearance. And if you find that it has gone up to the common canaliculus, then add a dactrocystectomy, send the dactrocystectomy, nasal acrimal duct margins, and then based on how you get, keep, keep on going uh, and clearing the tumor. Example of squamous cell carcinomas involving the canaliculus. Here you can see I haven't sacrificed the whole thing. Most of these people, even if you have sacrificed, if the upper canaliculus is good, then they usually don't have uh, an epiphora. And sometimes it is also possible that, uh, you know, it, the, the belief that the lower canaliculus drains 70% and upper 30% is not true. Uh, it is very variable, even in individual. Like when I did my, uh, for example, functional MRI, uh, MRDCG, I found that my right upper one tends to drain more and my left lower one tends to drain more. So some people have 50-50, some people the upper one drains more. And some people like me, one eye, upper one is predominant, another eye, the lower one is predominant. So it's very variable. So never for a second believe that if you just get rid of a lower one, 70% is gone and that doesn't happen like that. Another example of uh, squamous cell carcinoma, which is infiltrating the canaliculus, like you see here in the inset, the pathology of this particular patient, this is the image of the distal canaliculus, right? So this is the canalicular epithelium that you see, little hyperplastic, but what do you see all around it? Nice tumor cell nest. And this is a patient that we manage with an extended dactrocystectomy. These are a few of the papers that talk about what I had just talk on, uh, spoken about, the uh, canalicular malignancies. So in summary, we looked at a uh, large spectrum of canalicular lesions and all these lesions are actually in depth. These are each one of them is a presentation and I'm sure you might have heard from a lot of people each one of them as a separate presentations and entities. Uh, we looked at canalicular agenesis and the critical point that we took out of canalicular agenesis is that whenever you have punctal agenesis, it's likely to be associated with canalicular agenesis. So if you're sure of punctal agenesis, there's no point in cutting down and trying to find the canaliculus. We looked at canalicular wall dysgenesis and types of canalicular wall dysgenesis and in all the hypoplastic variants, it's important to be careful while you're probing or dilating it because you don't want the hypoplastic canalicular wall to just split open. And then we looked at infective canaliculitis and how now we know why infective canaliculitis is a little more persistent. We also saw that whatever the microbiology shows, actinomyces may be a minor player, but it's usually around there. Okay. And then we looked at canalicular traumas and foreign bodies and how do we uh, go about managing them and uh, uh, complications that happens if we don't uh, do that very well. We looked at a lot of dactyloendoscopy images of how actually canalicular stenosis and obstruction happens and how trephines can work and how we are now trying to look at minimally invasive options of using a balloon canaliculoplasties. And in the end, we looked at the canalicular malignancies and how important it is to consent all these patients, though it might look like a lid lesion, but how important it is to consent these patients for an extended dactrocystectomy preoperatively. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir, for such an extensive coverage of canaliculi and their disorders, which we as residents or even fellows, we don't usually see the whole spectrum very commonly in our clinics. Or even if we do, it's very difficult for us to always identify each of them. So there are a few questions which I would like to ask, if with your permission. Yeah. First one is uh, between uh, in cases with punctal agenesis, how frequently are they also associated with canalicular agenesis and what is the easiest management approach? So there was this very nice guy called uh, Hussein from UK um, who had put up a very nice study uh, where they looked at uh, the frequency of canalicular stenosis in punctal stenosis. And, and this was when I was a fellow, this paper came in. And when, when I looked back with the DACA endoscopy, I found that to be actually true. So the number is approximately 70%. So broadly, you can say three-fourths of the patients who have punctal stenosis, expect them to also have canalicular stenosis. So it's always a good idea. So whenever you are going to dilate it, always just see one of the reasons, that's the reason why monocasts tend to help. 
So monocars not only take care of the punctal stenosis, they also take care of the canalic stenosis component. So, and in the event that you're doing a balloon canaliculoplasty, it's a good idea to go to the whole length of the canaliculus, even if you don't have a daiquiri endoscopy, because expect that three, four of three fourths of them are going to have some form of canaliculus stenosis. So in uh, patients with chronic canalicular inflammation, which is not res uh, resolving with steroids or uh, anti-inflammatory, what is the management and what is the usual outcome in these cases? Most of the time, canalicular inflammation, if you're looking at non-infective variants, it's mostly ICID only. So I would not give a prolonged steroid for them. Steroid for me is only the initial management where I'm going to start them with steroids and cyclosporin, restresses, right? So I'm going to start with them uh, both. And today morning, I just got to know that is that like uh, the Sun Pharma is now coming up with uh, uh, an Indian brand of cyclosporin. Uh, I think they're calling it some sequa, cycloimmune sequa or something like that. Not the regular cycloimmune because cyclosporin regular was quite uh, stinging. Cyclosporin can be really uncomfortable to the patients, uh, you know. So... It's now hopefully we have some Indian brands because restasis is a little expensive also. And you need to use these uh, uh, cyclosporin for on an average for a period of three to six months. You know, so that can be expensive for our regular patients. So uh, just, just to tell you that there are some Indian brands, so look after Indian brands because they're a little cheaper and we need to be a little conscious about uh, the expenses cost to our patients. Uh, but uh, that aside, I start them on steroid Rapid tapering steroid in three to four weeks, steroids are out. And by that time, cyclosporin takes its effect because you have started cyclosporin along with that and continue cyclosporin for a period of three to six months. And at three months, I usually reassess them. Uh, like, for example, if I'm looking at ICID or something, I'll see whether I have downstage the disease or not. If the disease is decently downstage and quiet, and yet, but yet not completely resolved, then that's the time to go in and then dilate it, place a monoca under the cover of cyclosporin, continue cyclosporin, again post-operatively for three to six months. One month later on, remove the stent, and then again continue cyclosporin till the inflammation comes down. So it, it's a very tailor-made kind of a thing based on, on things. Very rarely, just with cyclosporin, uh, you would find that the disease is completely downstage and everything is resolved. So that can also happen. Uh, so, at what stage of the disease would you start cyclosporin from the first stage? Of any stage of the disease. Any stage. Because, Including because the last stage? In, uh, no, last stage anyway, if it is completely shut down with scar, then it does cyclosporin okay. anyway is not going to work in that thing. Mm -hmm. Even if it is a complete membranous obstruction stage 4, then also cyclosporin is not going to go inside the canalicula to act. So, in those cases, then like stage 4 is membranotomy. You just remove the membrane, just try to explore it. If you are able to salvage, then place a monoca and then start cyclosporin simultaneously. Stage five anyway is, uh, you know, it's all burnt out disease. So there's, you know, you lose that opportunity. But uh, canalicular inflammations are very unforgiving. So the time you see them, start them on steroids and restresses right at that time. Um, sir, in cases of canalicular adhesion, which are infective in nature, are is microbiology always... Uh advisable to um, uh, practically if you see yes, microbiology doesn't really help a great deal uh, unless you know if you're looking at multi drug resistance so what i what i normally do is that if i am not aware of uh, things i usually put them on uh, moxifloxacin to begin with uh, but if you have microbiology you should utilize it because it, it hardly takes anything just milk it out and just place something on the slide it, it really doesn't cost much and the microbiologist can tell you sometimes the advantage is that if it's multi-drug resistance then you might have some idea of how to uh, go about it if it is multi-drug then uh, i would go intervene a little surgically a little earlier and then make sure that i wash it well with betadine and those things Uh, the next question is, uh, is it advisable to repair canalicular tear with easily available IV cannulas or is... Not at all. Our country has been so much for this because we are working on this kind of work. And we know that uh, you know, canalicular is so unforgiving. Canalicular wall is something that if you scratch it, 
it is going to come back with vengeance uh, so absolutely no monoka and nowadays we have even oro which is quite cheap oro uh, stands which are there so there are a lot of stands in some some stands are also there ha huh, you can say that if i to see the question is that if you start saying uh, hum yahan kaam karte hamare paas nahi rahega tumhare paas kabhi bhi nahi rahega fir waise unless you make efforts to have that right so you will have oro stands which are locally made indian made you can get any time you want i would prefer fci because fci is a little less uh, you know pro inflammatory i would always prefer mini monoka um, probably because the medical grade silicon is a little better uh, and it is a little more uh, uh, sturdy and less pliable as compared to oro stand but at least oro stand is something that you can begin with and it's not at all expensive so i i wouldn't go with iv line and other things not at all so and in uh, cases of canalicular injury in very severely lacerated wounds so uh, how can we easily identify is there any specific way to identify the cut ends because they might be lacerated or above uh, well, damaged sometimes if it is very medial canthal lesion and then if it's above then it might sometimes you know it's little difficult to find that out and there are many ways in which people have done that one what i in the rare event i am not able to find what i do is that i try to uh, use a viscoelastic uh, and i either do give a fluorescein to that or you can add uh, any color that is your favorite to that one and then uh, you just inject the advantage of using fluorescein as compared to a uh, saline is that saline suddenly comes back and you, it, it the gush is so quick especially in a uh, in a cut end of it because a lot of the lower segment say for example if it is a lower canaliculi a lot of that lower segment is already not there right so whatever you are placing from the upper canaliculus you are almost there at the at the op- other end which is cut end so anything you place quickly it just gushes out you don't want that you want to have all something which is a little controlled so you inject very slowly so that then you see from where that viscoelastic slowly is coming on so that you can identify peacefully at the same time it's a little less Uh, traumatic to the cut end of the canaliculus, so that that's usually there. Some people also use um, the pigtail probes, uh, which I don't like uh, again because it is simply not designed for the canaliculi, because it doesn't follow the, it doesn't respect the canalicular anatomy. अलग है अच्छे से ढूंढोगे तो मिल जाएगा ढूंढोगे तो खुदा भी मिलेगा यार ये तो क्या चीज़ है कनालिकल So it's usually the proximal end is easier to find, but the distal end might be uh, since. Yeah, it is difficult. Obviously, it, 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 if it is quite distal, then it is going to be there. But then you can there are so many ways in which you can you, you can surely find that out. Ah, uh, sir, you showed a couple of images of the uh, the papilloma and the pigmented papilloma within the ah uh, canaliculus. Now, ah. Uh, when it's a big tumor involving the puncta we know what to do but these small ones where you can just see the end popping out what do you uh, how how do you go about with the management like suppose you have to go for the biopsy or uh, something biopsy is a little easy because most of the time because anything which is hiding in the canaliculus you obviously are not aware of it unless it comes anywhere near the punctum right that's where we are aware of it so it's it's so at that point of time i dilate the punctum a little bit put in a dacre endoscope uh okay. and and dacrendoscope is again you know log hawa bana ke rakhe hain uska it's something which is very easy to use if you cannot put up a probe into the canaliculus you can always put a dacrendoscope right and any any endoscopic system you have you can a- attach that to it it's as simple as that right if you're you doing any nasal endoscopy any of the system can you can attach the dacrendoscope which is a small probe like structure so um so i just place it up and then i see the extent posterior extent of it suppose if it is something which is proximal that's the time when i just take a small snip and then i completely remove that off i won't take a biopsy i'll completely go after it but in the event that i find that it's multifocal or it is a little long uh, then i would take a biopsy and see what it is um squamous cell for, you know like unlike the conjunctiva where we have uh, good resolution with interferons topical interferons for some strange reason I have not found canalicular squamous papillomas responding to interferons. Uh, I don't know why that doesn't happen. Uh, 
so we have done several washings of canalic lye with interferons everything up canalic lye you know we washed it we bathed those into into interferon but still doesn't uh, respond very well to that one so in case again the same thing is there if if it is uh, uh, something that doesn't respond to that then the only way is to just open it up and uh, then see that one for some some interesting reason i have not found uh, people who have uh, this canalicular squamous papillomas to have lacrimal sac papillomas which which appear to me a little logical that i should find some lacrimal sac papillomas for some strange reason i never found one or two cases were different but then they were very extensive but most of them where it is restricted if it is focal in the canalic lights unlikely that it's something is in the lacrimal sac so you would approach it through the pancta itself initially yeah 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 of course through the pancta okay. so how frequently have you encountered uh, isolated canalicular melanomas or uh, involving the other bidirectional i have never seen that hmm. nevoide i have seen canalicular nevoide i have seen pigmented papillomas i have seen i don't remember i have seen seeing canalicular isolated canalicular melanomas arising from canalicular because i don't think canalicular epithelium has some kind of melanocytes or something so it's may be unlikely to find that one something that from the surface seeding into the canalicula is possible seeding into the lacrimal sac is possible but de novo from the canalicula i don't think that's at least i don't remember ever having heard of it so i think that's all with the questions and thank uh, you so much sir that was a really really nice lecture thank you thank you so much Take for care. the lecture sir it was really nice having you twice over at iFocus online and hope we get to have more uh, in-depth discussions more, with you. Yeah, yeah I think we will get more than the lacrimal logo. No, sir, we are going to go into detail, so it's fine. Yeah, there are so many things to actually know that. It's very interesting with these, all these aspects, like for example, if you sit with canalic lobs and then discuss canalic lobs as a separate entity, it's, it's very, very interesting. Each one of this is like quite detailed uh, to understand what is happening and then you also have so many research ideas out of it because so many things are unknown you know, and so many things that you guys can contribute i'm actually relying upon your generations because the older generations are quite useless so it's uh, it's it's very important that you guys take this mantle and take it forward and develop this inquisitiveness of why things are happening and uh, whatever we are doing it you know just keep asking yourself why am i doing what i am doing and is there a better way to do the same thing so so these questions are going to you know take us into the next thing and uh, that's the biggest way you can uh, give me thanks that i should be happy in my grave when i go that you guys are doing great work out there we'll try our best absolutely uh, sure take care Bye. See Thank you, sir. I'll just like night. to conclude with an announcement for our next uh, session, which will be on infections and tumors of the lacrimal system, which will be covered by Dr. Mohammad Shahid, Shahid Alam, which is on uh, November 8th. So see you all again. Hope you can join us too, sir. And thank you so much for tonight, uh, tonight's lecture. Yeah. Good Bye. Night. Good night. Bye. Bye.